All right, I'll so your final one now, I think. All right, I told you it was going to get juicy, Craig. Here yeah, you go. yeah. So earlier you talked about the danger of the kind of slideshows that kind of reveal mathematics, right? I did, I did. My takeaway three is the power of a slideshow for mathematics. No way. It is. It go is. On, it was as if we played it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So I have recently actually started to use um, slideshows for maths, and this has been kind of inspired by my first point, which is all about the importance of curriculum. And see, like trying to get my head around, how is it that you can actually, at a whole school level, specify exactly the procedure that's going to be used so that when a student learns a procedure in year seven and then they encounter it again as a, you know, building block of something else in year eight and so on, it's actually the same and students don't get confused and you're actually just reinforcing the same uh, neural pathways, which mm-hmm. is exactly what we want. And I came down on the side of like, yeah, slideshows are great. Uh, they're also really powerful for creating uh, daily reviews, which is like a really big thing here in Australia. It's kind of like really fast paced practicing. It's kind of like a do now, but it's usually um, facilitated by with a slideshow. Mm-hmm. And often you kind of, you, you, you often do that thing that we were talking about earlier in your second, in your first takeaway as well, um, I think it was, where you do a check for understanding and then you reteach anyway. Yeah. Right? So students are getting both and every student's kind of brought along for the ride. The reason why I'm, I've been loving these kind of slideshows for maths recently is because, first of all, it, it, it frees up my cognitive load. I mm-hmm. don't actually have to be thinking about what comes next because the slideshow has it for me. Now, obviously, I'm not going to the classroom without looking at this slideshow, uh, but the difference is rather than prepare the lesson, now I just need to prepare for the lesson. Um, well, I mean, I do I do need to do both, actually, because um, I'm writing the slideshows. But if someone else is taking the slideshows that I was writing or if someone else was writing one, I don't have to prepare it, just have to prepare for it. The other thing, what that does is it frees up my working memory because I'm not thinking about the what the next step of the mathematics is And I can focus more on whether or not the students are paying attention. So linking back to that kind of coaching diagnosis, right? So if I show up in next line of working and we're coming back to kind of some of Michael Pershing's worked example content here, I can say, all as in the board, reading line two of working, and I can progressively reveal it. And I can actually face the students and I can see if every student is is focusing on that. Uh, Like I mentioned, standardized procedures, really great for knowledge management year to year. So if, you teach a lesson and it doesn't go that well, you can tweak that lesson when you're finished and that's like there stored for next year, right? With a hypothesis, with a note. If the teacher's kind of doing the working on the board, there's no record of that. How do you how do you actually get fine grain kind of refinements of what's going on? Uh, and also, uh, you know, it's just supports new teachers phenomenally because the, the amount of time it would take for you, for you to sit down, for an experienced teacher in the department to sit down with a new teacher and say, all right, here's, there's you know, 50, no, probably, I don't know, let's take a guess, 100 procedures that we need to teach the students this year, something like that. Um, here's exactly how we teach every one of them at this school. And then expecting the new teacher to somehow record that, store it somewhere, it's just completely unrealistic. Whereas if you put it in a slideshow or similar, um, you can you can totally master that. Now, the cost is, takes a massive time, there's a massive upfront cost to create it. Uh, it can take a couple of hours even to create a, a lesson, whereas, you know, you can probably just rock up to a class. I have a year eight class this year, I could just rock up and teach it. But with the slideshow, it takes a significant amount of time. But I think long term, for a school, the investment is worth it. Right. Strap yourselves in here, right? So you... You, you add me on the rehearsal bit, right? I can't see you getting me on board with this. So I'll, I'll give you my, my response. So first, but I'm glad you've brought this up, Paul, because this, this is what we want. If we, you just agree all the time, nobody's happy with that. Let, let's, let's get it kicking off here. So for, just to clarify what this looks like, are we talking, so you would have animated, let's take expanding double brackets because we were talking about it before. So you'd have kind of pre-typed in each line of the solution and it's all animated to appear kind of one click at a time, one, you know, line by line and so on and so forth. Will that mm-hmm. be right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. Okay. This is interesting. So the first thing to say, and again, this, this sounds like a re- real horrible thing to say, I can only talk from my experiences. Some of the worst lessons I've seen in the last few months have been these kind of 
pre pre animated ones because of the reason I spoke about before that it's this click 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 through thing. I think one thing that suffers straight away is the pace. I think teachers find it very hard to get the pace right without they go too fast because they're not having to do the thinking. They're literally just having to do the, the click. But the biggest reason why I don't do this, and I'll offer a solution to this in a second, is because of the disconnect. So the message I want to give kids is what I'm doing here at the front is exactly the thing that I want you to be doing in your books, because we're all in this together. I'm going to do it and you're going to be able to do it. I think there's a massive disconnect if kids see you, the way you're doing it is you're pressing a button on a blank screen where things are just magically appearing versus the way they're having to do it with a pen on grid paper or whatever in their exercise books, actually using their brain. And it can literally seem like magic is happening where these things are appearing. Now, of course, the worst versions of this is where the teacher, as I said before, doesn't have a, literally doesn't have a clue what's going to appear on the screen. And obviously that's going to be, that's going to be a disaster. But I still think even with a skilled practitioner, you don't have that same connection with the kids during that modeling as you would do if you do what I'm going to suggest instead, which hopefully kind of solves a few of your concerns. So I'll, I'll outline this, what I do now, and then I'll, I'll shut up. So one option is you take a PowerPoint, you remove all the kind of pre-animated solutions. You just have the question and same on, an, on a one note or whatever, and you do the kind of modeling on the board. Fine, fine. Um, what I think is better is the visualizer and getting an exercise book that is exactly the same as the kids' book. So you're removing that disconnect. I am literally writing with a pen, with a ruler in the exact same thing that you're going to be writing on. You can see me doing it. I'm facing the front. I'm not going to turn to the board. So I've got better kind of sense of your attention. But here's the really interesting thing. So I think you make a really good point, Hal, that when you're, when you're kind of doing the modeling, it's not that you're just focusing on the modeling. You're also focusing on all the kids paying attention and so on and so forth. So you can make your life a lot easier by using this kind of double page approach. So what I do is the left hand page of my exercise book, that's where I'm doing my live modeling. The right on page, I've got the written solution already done that I've written out when I've prepped. I've also got it annotated with anything where I think the kids may struggle or where a question I want, might want to ask the kids. So actually, as I'm doing the live modeling, I can have a little glance to my right and I can remove some of that kind of, you know, cognitive load of having to remember the solution. And particularly if I'm doing some tricky maths like, you know, grade 12 or grade 13 maths where, I, you know, I have to really, really think about it. Having that support network is, is really helpful, whereas... The way I used to do that, where when the math was tricky, I did used to do a lot of clicking. I just don't think the kids got it as much. So I'm a massive live modeler, but I think using the exercise book to reduce the disconnect and also using the adjacent page to provide that extra support, I think that's the best of both worlds. But let me th let me hand it back to you. Cool. I think I think what you suggested is a really uh, great approach for sure, Craig. And that was actually what I was doing just before. I've recently moved to experimenting with the slideshows because I found that, um, well, first of all, I can write much more neatly on a book than I yeah, can on the board. Yeah, me too, me too. So this setting out a lot better. Second, you've got like that page equals board kind of approach where yeah. you're showing, you're modeling to students exactly how you want them uh, to lay it out. And, and yeah, definitely had those cognitive load benefits. There were a couple of challenges I felt found with that though. Um, often I couldn't show everything in the one visualizer shot that I wanted to mm -hmm. for students. So I might kind of do go do some working off the bottom of the visualizer shot. I'd have to shift my shift my book up and the question might disappear or some key point might disappear. Yep, yep. Whereas with with like the design of a slideshow, you can take the time to go, all right, what what do students need to have on this this page? Um, I think I think that I'll respond to the pace thing as well. I think a slideshow is actually much more flexible with pace because you can speed up or slow down depending upon what's needed by by students. Whereas if you're writing, you can only really slow down because you can only write so fast. And a good example um, from last lesson was we were looking at first finding the highest common factor. So that was the first school that I kind of taught students. They did some practice of that. And then the next um, school that we worked on was factorizing. And the first step in factorizing was finding the highest common factor, right? Um, and I found that I didn't need to model 
finding the highest common factor again. So mm. I, in the slideshow, I could just click bang and that would just animate the, all the steps we yes. showed before. And I was like, that's what we did before. Remember, this is what it's supposed to look like. And then we'd follow on from there. Uh, but I, I understand what you're saying about the kind of maybe students aren't getting it. I mean, I, I, I'm actually, I'm not as convinced as you are about the fact that if it looks like their tech, their book, then that's going to help them understand it better than if it looks like a slideshow. Um, but I would say that if you do the, we do well, um, as you was kind of highlighting before that modeling, there will actually be kind of a check for understanding yes. at each step. Right. So it's like, all right, here's the, I do step one, bang, step two, bang, step three, bang, step four, bang. All right. We do step one. You have a go. I'm going to check your understanding. All right. You got that step two. You have a go. I'm going to check your understanding. Step three. I'm going to check. Step four. I'm going to check. Okay. You do put it all together. Mm. So I think, I think if you're doing good teaching practice with the, I do, we do, you do structure, it, you you're actually a lot more flexible with the with the slideshow in terms of your pace and so on, and it's going to be a lot more efficient than if you're trying to do it with pen and paper. Interesting, interesting. Just two more bits on this then. So the first, I, I forgot to mention this point before. You said a big advantage of having the slideshow was that you would have a record of your teaching and so on. I, com I completely agree with that. It, of course, it will be the same with the book, right? The, the teacher examples book. And it, again, I think it's quite a nice document that you can, you know, add your annotations, add your comments, and it's there. It's also good to photocopy for the kids if they were missing a lesson and, and so on and so forth. So you can work with that. Well, my final kind of question on this all, and this is this was the kind of nail in the coffin for me on, on animation. What about like geometry stuff? What about transformations? What about angle measuring and stuff where, and like compass work and things like that, surely you're not doing that on the slideshow. Yeah. There are different modalities that work work better for different things. There's never going to be like a one size fits all. Slideshows always better. Books always better. Like for a lot of that stuff that you've just mentioned, then I think often like an animation is actually going to be one of the most helpful tools, right? So you're going to jump jump on a YouTube clip and show if it's some sort of a transformation. Um, you're going to show a shape rotating, or you're going to show a slide, or or, or a shift, or something like that. Um, so I think modalities are going to change. So couldn't agree more. Um, so yeah, and, and if you need to model how to use a compass, then you're going to want to jump under the visualizer with that for sure as well, um, definitely. Um, so yeah. All right, okay. We'll leave we'll leave that hanging there. That's good. Okay. Agree, disagree, agree there. Disagree, agree, agree. That's all. Totally. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> totally. I mean, I mean, I'm you know, I think I think you're more firm on this than I am. Um, this is a space that I'm exploring uh, and kind of checking out. One one other thing I want to say on this is mm. I think that the way they do it. Um, Greg's school is they don't, I'm not sure if they actually do animate the solutions that they show students, but what they have is like the question, yep. then the teacher might model it on the board or on a visualizer. And then the next slide will be the work solution, uh, not necessarily yes. animated, but, but the point of that next slide, and I think he might've talked about this in, in the podcast with you, the point of the next slide is for the beginning teachers who aren't sure what the method is, right? So I think you can kind of have the best, I think there's probably a way to kind of get a lot of the benefits yes. of what you were talking about and a lot of benefits of what I've talked about with some sort of a hybrid approach um, in there too. And then, you know, if you wanted the scaffold next to the teacher on the right-hand side under the visualizer or not under the visualizer, you could just, they could print out that slide for themselves or something. So that's probably, Greg's, Greg, Greg's probably beaten us to it, Craig, and found the optimal <laughs> solution already. <laughs> That's good. All right. Love it. Right. Okay.